right, everybody, welcome to Take a Break with Jake. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jake, and I'm over here at the zoo behind the scenes with our bongo. And I'm here with Nicole, who's our uh, lead hoofstock keeper, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the three female bongo that call the zoo their home. Hi, guys. I'm Nicole. So we have three female bongo here. This is Shira. Shira will be eight years old on Friday. Um, and then this is Shira's uh, second calf, Marcy. Marcy will be four in two weeks. And then we also have Brooks, who's walking down the fence line right now. Brooks is um, nine years old, so, and she's no relation to these two. So these guys are back here for breeding purposes. Um, in 2013, we have bred uh, five successful calves between Shira and Brooks. Marcy's, like I said, will be four in a couple weeks, so as soon as we can get a new breeding male, uh, we can start breeding with her as well. Awesome. So back here, we're behind the scenes, basically right behind the train and the Africa field to give you all kind of a, a glimpse of where we are. Um, and like Nicole mentioned, the bongo are here for breeding purposes. We participate in a variety of species survival plans here at the National Zoo. Those plans kind of help dictate where animals should be moved to, which animals should breed and with whom, um, to make sure we have genetic viability for the species for the long-term future. Um, and so, although not all of our animals here at the zoo are on exhibit, you can see a lot of them on Jackson Pass tours. The Bongo Pass will be seen from the train ride if you're looking in the right direction. Um, so once we open back up, there are definitely ways that you can come meet these beautiful girls. Um, and Nicole, I am always curious, like, how much do these guys weigh? Yeah, so um, the adults, so Brooks and Shira weigh about 510 pounds. Wow. Marcy's still got a little bit to grow, so she's about 450 right now. Um, males can get up to 880 pounds. Awesome. So the range for an adult, females would be about 450 to high end of a male is 880. How does that compare to like other hoofstock species? Just like to give people a frame of reference. Yeah, so um, bongo are the largest of the forest antelope species, weight wise and height wise, and they're third largest of all antelopes worldwide. Wow. Now in the wild, these bongo are found in different parts of Africa, correct? Correct. Um, can you kind of give us a glimpse of like where you might find the bongo out in the wild? So there's two subspecies of bongo. These guys are eastern or mountain bongo, and they are actually only native to Kenya. There's about a hundred of them left in the wild. There's about 600 worldwide in captivity, um, participating in the SSP or the Species Survival Plan. But as far as like actually in the wild, there's a hundred in Kenya, and they're divided between four different um, mountain forest ranges in Kenya. Then there's a, another subspecies, the western or the lowland bongo, and they're found throughout western, Aust or western Africa. <laughs> um, but there's about 1,500 of them, so they're doing a little bit better. Gotcha. So this is a critically endangered species that we're working with here at the zoo. Correct. Which is pretty great. Um, Friday is Endangered Species Day, y'all. So this is one of the many species that our awesome keepers here at the zoo work with um, to help preserve species long term of uh, breeding in human care is kind of instrumental. So Nicole, some other questions about the bongo. You mentioned that they're forest antelopes, Correct. right? And they're the third largest antelope species overall. Mm -hmm. That's pretty fascinating. Tell me about their horns. So these guys are spiral horned antelope. It's actually, they had a hard time classifying um, bongo because in all the other spiral horned antelope species, the females either don't have horns or their horns are not spiraled. So this is the only species that fits in that family where the females also have spirally horns. Now they are different from the male's horns. Um, as you can see with our girls, their horns are relatively thin and they go kind of close together and they do have a spiral. Males are a lot more wider set and the horns themselves are a lot thicker. Um, so there is a difference between males and females in the bongo's horns and their appearance. When they're younger, they all have this um, bright chestnut color and the stripes, both males and females. But as males age and that testosterone gets going, they turn darker and almost black. So as adults, you can definitely tell a difference. Now I've heard that like when you touch a bongo, your fingers like kind of show up with that same color. Yeah, you can kind of see it on my glove from when I was scratching them a little bit. Um, yeah, that red rubs off. Um, it's actually, when you're new to working with them, it can be disheartening when, the, when they're outside in the rain and they get wet. 
it'll look like they're bleeding oh. because the red pigment comes off as the water droplets fall on them. That's crazy. But it's just their pigmentation. That's way cool. Um, you know, we have, I think in the description, Kelsey mentioned a little bit about Nicole's work um, with bongos in the wild, right? Mm -hmm. um, so can you share a little bit about what you did, where you went and all of that? Yeah, so I went to Kenya to work with the Bongo Surveillance Project um, in March of 2018. And I was the first and so far only international volunteer that they've ever allowed to go and help them. It's a tiny organization. They've only got about 20 people there in Kenya on the ground running. Um, and most of those are on a volunteer basis. Uh, that actually work there. So they put 100% of their resources into saving bongo um, in the wild. And like I said, they uh, are only doing bongo. There's only about a hundred of them in the wild. Most of those people who this is literally what they do day in, day out have only seen one or two bongo in their lifetime and they live where these guys are native to. Um, so it's very eye opening to see that kind of difference there as opposed to some other species in the wild. Yeah. yeah, if you guys want to know more about Nicole's work in Kenya um, in 2018, um, we've got a great blog post um, on our website about that where you can read more. I should have grabbed that link for the description, but well. <laughs> <laughs> so habitat loss and poaching are the two big threats of on those that I know of. Are there others that um, they face out in the wild? It's mostly just poaching, and that has curbed over the years. Okay. Um, it's not as big of an issue as it was. Um, they used to poach them in Africa for their pelts because they're beautiful and their horns because they're beautiful. And then also it was believed that their meat was magical and would increase longevity if you consumed it. Okay. So there, there was a big problem about that. The poaching is mostly curbed. I don't want to say it's completely gone, but they don't find, they don't find many instances of that. It's actually just a matter of, it's really hard to find them. All right. Um, they, you know, most of the time if they see them, it's on a camera trap as opposed to actually somebody putting eyes on them. I will say the day after I left my trip, I didn't see one the entire time I was there for two weeks, but the day I left and was heading back to the airport, I got a call and they saw a group of 10 that wow. morning right outside the hotel I stayed at the whole time. That's one tenth of the entire wild population, yeah. which is kind of crazy. That's but a bummer it's, for but it's people, awesome but that it's they exciting did that they saw it. Them, yeah. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, it means that you know the populations are growing. They saw some calves, so that's awesome. all great news. Um, so speaking of calves, the gestation period is about nine and a half months. I was reading. Um, you've been here when they've actually all, had calves, right? All of our calves. That's yes. so exciting. Um, tell us a little bit about like when a mother's giving birth and all of that. What preparation do y'all do? Okay, so bongo actually have a really bad instance of their calves splaying. Um, and what that means is when the calf is born and the calf is trying to stand up, their legs will fall, you know, like fall out to the sides from the sides of them and they're unable to stand up and get their footing. Um, and due to this, a lot of places have lost calves because of, um, they're not able to get up and actually get the nutrients from their mom. Mm. Um, we have thankfully not had any issues of that. Um, but because of that, we do have to take special precautions with them when the moms are ready to have to give birth. Um, we do have a barn for them and we make sure they're inside their barn for that time and we pad the stalls down. Um, so, and we've tried different things. Like I said, we've had five successful calves and we've tried something different for most of those <laughs> calves because we did have three calves that did splay. Okay. Um, but we were here for it and we were able to address the situation as it happened. Gotcha. Um, and then we've had two that didn't. So we would put shavings that we'd, you know, lay their floor in mats and then cover those mats and shavings. Um, but we still have calves splay like that. We have covered the stalls in sand, do like a thick, thick layer of sand. Um, and we still have calves splay in that. And then um, most recently, we've also tried um, sodding the stalls. We've actually ran inside and sawed their entire indoor hole in with grass. Um, but like I said, we had three calves that splayed and two didn't. All of Brooks's calves have splayed and Shira's two didn't. Interesting. Um, and it was Shira that we tried the sod for. So it could just be genetic. There's not a lot of information out there to know if that's a genetic thing with the moms. So it could be genetics and her calves just don't or the sod could have been helpful. Um, we would definitely want to try the sod for Brooks's next um, calf if we do breed her again. That's awesome. 
Kelsey, do we have any questions so far from our audience? <clears throat> no questions about bongos, but I do see a question from Gabby about um, when we may reopen. Gabby, unfortunately, we don't have a good answer for you. Um, we are at the mercy of the mayor's reopening plan. We're included in phase three of that. Um, so we probably have a few good weeks of being closed yet to go. Um, but uh, we do have some ways that you can support us during this time of closure. Jake, do you want to <laughs> enlighten our friends on that? Yeah, so a couple of really easy ways that you can help out if you go um, to the links that Kelsey has in the description of this video. Um, there's a donating link where you can donate directly to the zoo. We have matching donors right now that will match up to a certain dollar amount. Um, so that's a really great opportunity to help out the zoo. The other way that you can also help out is by going to shop.nashvillezoo.org. You can find almost everything that's in our gift shop on site online right now, and you can get all of that stuff delivered right to your door. So both of those are really great ways that you can help us out. We are a nonprofit, so every bit um, that you can give to us helps us um, help animals in the wild. Because just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean that we're stopping our <laughs> conservation efforts, um, or our education efforts. So everything that our community can do to support us is really great. Um, Nicole, yes. tell me a little bit about the training that you would do with Bongo. I know like they're kind of, you know, just there a lot. They don't really eat a ton of like treats and stuff. So what, how difficult is it? What, what do you go through? Okay, so it depends obviously on the individual, just mm -hmm. like any species. Um, so Bongo are an antelope species. So with that, they are relatively timid and you know, they've got a fight or flight. Um, in the wild, Bongo, like I said, are, li are forest antelope. So they live, and these guys are mountain Bongo. So they live in high steep mountains that are thick, thick forest. So their natural defense would be to run through the trees and hide. They're not built for running long distance, like on a savanna, because um, they're not savanna animals. So they, they're just gonna run and jump into a tree bushel and hide. Um, so knowing that about them, you just, you know, those are things you take into consideration when training an animal. Um, these guys are all trained to target. So they'll come up to us um, and we present like a target stick to them and they will touch their nose to it and we reward them and you can use that target to move them from one place to another um, if you need them to go somewhere. These guys are all hand injection trained so they'll come over to this fence line and they'll present themselves up along the fence and push their hips into the fence for us and then we can give them injection through the fence. That way we are protected through there, you know, from them. Like I said, these guys are 500 plus pounds. And They've got those, you know, two foot long horns that they could easily hurt you with or accidentally hurt you with. So we do try to do things protected. They're also weight trained. They will walk on a scale and we get their weights on them every month. Um, we work on blood training. Our old male was um, blood trained, but these females are not yet. It's a little bit more complicated with the girls because we have to do it out here outside. Um, our barn's not prepped for us to be able to work protected contact with them like that. Um, so having to work with them, it's difficult because if you're working with one female, another female could come up and totally wreck your training session. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's a little bit easier for injections because that's quick, but blood takes a little bit of time. So we're still working towards that with these girls. That's awesome though, that you're able to do so much. While this way is coming towards us, I just wanted to draw some attention to their coat and fur. Jay asked, um, I've noticed bongos in a copy have similar coloring patterns. Is that because they're both deep forest dwellers? Uh, probably. <laughs> they, um, bongo are actually the most vibrant colored <laughs> antelope of all the antelope species. Um, but that, that very well possibly. I, Okapis, so they blend in. Okapis are native to the rainforest, so that their coat definitely helps them blend into their environment. But being in Kenya, I did notice that the, um, the dirt, hi Brooksy, um, that the dirt and the clay that they have there is bongo colored. So like just the, that's their natural native environment. Um, they blend into it very well. So if you're looking like at a mountainside through the trees and you see some of that red chestnut color, most of the time that's going to be just their clay and their soil. Um, so they would blend into that remarkably well. That's really cool. And the, the stripes help them blend in with shadows, shadows for trees. <laughs> now we saw a little bit earlier, Nicole, a couple of the girls were like kind of tussling with mm -hmm. their horns. Is that like a very typical behavior for females? It is, yeah. Just sparring. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're just playing. They, they definitely was not aggressive. Right. Um, I mean, they could get aggressive and use their horns towards each other. We, you know, generally don't see that behavior. Uh, I've never seen it outside with them. Inside the barn sometimes, you know, they can get a little territorial over their space because they each have a stall. Mm -hmm. But outside, I've never seen that. Um, usually if it was aggressive, one would like try to pin the other one down. Oh, wow. And you would like, know. Their, yeah, they, okay. would, they would put their <laughs> horns and kind of throw the other one to the ground. Gotcha. Um, so if they're just, if they're just sparring, that's just fun. Cute. Nice little play time. Yeah. Um, coming from kind of a more tropical region, but still up in the mountains, what's their kind of temperature uh, requirements like? So here we, um, we kind of do it 40 and sunny and we'll let them outside and we raise it, you know, if it's cloudy or if it's rainy. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're pretty hardy. I mean, it gets decently cold there in Kenya and, you know, and they're in the mountains. So yeah. it's, you know, a little bit colder up there, the higher elevation that you get. Um, so yeah, they're, they're pretty good most of the time. I mean, and we'll put them out, you know, they've definitely been out with snow on the ground and stuff. If it's a nice day and the sun's coming out and it's getting warm, they can handle it. We just wouldn't keep them out in terribly cold temperatures for too long. That makes sense. Cool. I just feel like these guys are so elegant. Yeah, <laughs> My voice just cracked. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <That's> so emotional. <laughs> yeah, they are just truly beautiful creatures and just hanging out. They have such a massive space out here. Yeah. Which is really probably quite helpful to breeding. It is, yeah. That's pretty cool. And we've, I mean, this yard that we're in right now is our bachelor yard. Um, so this would be the yard where the male would hang out. Wow. Um, when we were not trying to breed. First, mm -hmm. you know, so he can hang out, he can still see the ladies, um, but just to keep them separate. But that works really nicely. So they see each other every day. They can get nose to nose every day. So then when we do put them back together, it's not alarming and nobody's new, you know, it's that just like, sense. oh yeah, I know you. We see you every day. <clears throat> yeah, um, it's an so easy transition. With, that helps with introductions, yeah. um, you know, and I mean, and there's definitely times where they all live together, you know, we've had a male and they all live together. Okay. It all just depends on, you know, are we breeding? Uh, right now we have three females, so would we be breeding all three? And at the same time, um, we probably don't really have the barn space to breed three females at once. <laughs> yeah, but, a lot of babies. But yeah, so at most we've had six bongo oh, wow. at like at one time. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that and because of space limitations, you have to kind of move them around. You know, we had a young male calf and so then the male calf couldn't be with the dad because he was becoming an adolescent and they might fight over territory. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we'd have young female calves and she can't breed with dad. So we would have to keep them separated, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So that's why it's really nice to have this separate yard for them. Um, that way nobody's kind of stuck in a smaller space. Like this is, I'd probably say a little bit more than an acre and that one's at least two. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Yeah, it's huge. Um, now, antelope and um, other such creatures that live kind of out in the savannas and in the grasslands over in Africa are usually seen in like massive herds. Mm -hmm. For the bongo, are they pretty social? Do they stay in smaller groups? They are really social. Um, the problem being there's only about a hundred of them. Right. <laughs> so it's really hard to gauge what their normal life is like. The largest group in the wild is in the Aberdares National Forest in okay. Kenya, um, and there it's a herd of about 50. Wow. Um, but then the smaller herds are about 10. Okay. So, you know, doing some research, it says anywhere from five to 50 um, individuals in a herd. But I mean, it all just depends on what we've got. Sure. And, and the size of the forest. Some of those smaller forests like Uburu, there's only a herd of about 10, but that forest is pretty small, okay. whereas Aberdares is huge. So they can accommodate 50, they can accommodate more than that, but that's where the largest group is. Gotcha. I was reading too that one of the conservation efforts out um, over in Africa is creating different wildlife corridors, which are basically like a pathway or an area of protected land in between two major parks or mm -hmm. other protected areas. Um, because what happens when humans come in, uh, Kind of grow their population in different areas we kind of fragment habitat for different wild species Correct. right um so one of the things that humans can do to help out is make sure that there are pathways and areas for animals to get from one large protected area to the next and we do that here in the united states as well for our different wildlife that live especially out in the western us um so think of your larger things like your bears and your wolves and your elk 
Um, we definitely have to make corridors or pathways to make sure that the animals can still migrate like they need to, still move around and use habitat like they need to um, without kind of interrupting human processes as well. So it's kind of like a give and a take. Um, we try to share the space with all the creatures that inhabit our earth. Um, Jessica, I see your question. Yes, you are hearing the gibbons, I believe, and the simings. Um, so good ear on that one, Jessica. And a cardinal. And a cardinal. Yeah, that's the only thing I've been hearing. <laughs> Jake, we see what your ears are tuned to. Yeah. I honestly didn't even notice the apes until you said it. <laughs> yeah, I think they're, they're kind of just I'm, there, right? I'm so used to that. <laughs> yeah, same. Now, Nicole, tell us a little bit about yourself as a keeper here at the zoo. How long have you been here? What do you do? All that stuff. Sure. Um, so I've been here 10 years. Uh, I've been on the hoofstock team for about eight and a half of that 10 years. Um, I'm currently the hoofstock lead keeper, so there's 10 of us on our team. Um, I'm the lead and then we also have a supervisor, so I just kind of help him with that. Um, we have quite a big collection, so we've off exhibit, we've got the bongo here and then the okapi. Uh, you can kind of oh, see, let's see if we can zoom in here. So you guys so can far. see these on the backstage pass tour. Um, whenever we open back up and then we've also got the giraffe and the rhinos those are on our team which are also big tour barns and exhibits um, and then we've got what we call the Africa exhibit um, which is our savanna exhibit the mixed species so it has the ostrich zebra bonobok eland on that field um, on the other side of the park, we've got the Baird's Tapers and the Yellowback Diker, all a part of our team. So we, the 10 of us that are on this team, rotate through all those areas um, and work with all of these animals together. You guys cover a ton of ground, yeah. like we figuratively do. and literally. Yes. And we've got all the, all the big guys, all the uh, large animals, basically, um, respectively, throughout the zoo for now. So yeah, That's awesome. Any other questions so far coming in, Kelsey? <clears throat> Let's see. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, no, I think we covered about everything. Cool, cool, cool. Nicole, <laughs> what's your favorite thing about bongos? Or like, what do you like to share with people about bongos? <sighs> Their personality. Um, they really are the most personable of the antelope species, or at least of the ones I've worked with and I've met at other facilities. Um, these guys are great. I mean, obviously they all have their own individual personality, but they're just very personable. They are Sweet. fight or flight, but they will come over and build a relationship. I mean, you've seen them walk over and come over throughout this. Um, within their barn, we come we come in and, you know, we've got like little windows into their barns and you open the window and they'll all come over and say hi. Oh, cute. Um, Precious. Yeah. And so it just, I really love that. And I love being able to build a relationship with them. These guys are definitely a species where... If you spend enough time with them, you can, you know, gain their trust and build a relationship throughout the years. Um, you know, like I said, I've, I've been here for five calves to be born, which is all of ours with these awesome. guys, since they've been moved back back to this area because they were on exhibit about okay. 10 years ago. Um, none of these individuals, but. Gotcha. Um, and so that's really great and working, working with the moms and with their kids, you know, that's definitely a lot of trust building sure, um, yeah. being able to go in there and, and I do work free contact with them which means I go in there with them um, and interact with them you know directly individually as well as as a herd um, so that's it's great that we're able to do that um, like I said with the training we do do the training uh, most of that is protective contact just for safety reasons yeah. but um, we are able to do a lot of it free contact as well if need be that's awesome um, Aaron, you're totally right. These guys are an antelope species. Um, and Nicole, remind me how heavy these guys are. Aaron's wondering. I think she tuned in late. Sure. These girls weigh, uh, Marcy's about 450. She's, she'll be four years old in a couple weeks. And then the other two adult females that are eight and nine weigh about 5'10", 5'20", if they're a little heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but males can get up to 880. That's crazy. Yeah, so they're super... Well, not super big, but they're pretty big. They're hefty antelope for small. sure. They're not small. You were right, Jake. <clears throat> Maureen um, is asking, did all the storm damage get cleaned up um, from last, was that last week? It was last week, last Sunday. <laughs> um, Time is flying. I think a lot, as far as exhibits, 
I think all of that is cleaned up, yeah. but they're still dealing with, you know, stuff off the path, public pathways and stuff that's not in animal areas. Yeah. And you kind of have a, a good view behind you guys of all of our um, goats and alpaca are watching us like hawks right now. <laughs> they're um, in their um, vacation yard, as we're calling it, while their exhibit is um, getting cleaned up some more. But um, yeah, they're doing pretty good. Let's see, I just saw one of their gals run a little bit, but. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you guys want to share about bongos um, or I guess anything, you know? <laughs> Any other questions? I, I mean, I, I could talk about everything. Them all day, yeah, but. yeah. Um, do you have a favorite bongo? I feel like we should do that while they're far away so they can uh, hear you. Yeah. Who's your yeah, favorite? You know, I mean, for different reasons. Brooks, uh, this is our oldest. She's nine. I do love Brooks, but she's. I also love Shira. I can't decide a favorite between the two of them. Um, Shira came to us from Louisville Zoo. I went and picked her up and brought her back. And she was very standoffish. And we had to, or I had to work really hard yeah. to gain her trust. Um, and, you know, she was not, I don't think she was free contact there. And then she has had two calves with us. One of which is Marcy, who's also in here. Um, so... I favor her, you know, because I work so hard to build that trust and that relationship with her. But then Brooks, who's the one that's kind of separate right now uh, with the wider set horns. Brooks is a special gal. She's the first one that, you know, I watched go through pregnancy. And we've just gone through so much throughout the years. I mean, she's nine and I've worked with her, you know, since she was like eight or worked with her for about eight years. Really? So since she was like one. Um, so you've got like a huge emotional investment in the entire herd, it seems like. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Can't pick a favorite. That's fair. Um, That's okay. And, and Brooks is a little special. She's a little hard of seeing. Um, she's got a, gen you know, genetically she is cross-eyed and that affects her vision quite a bit. So we've had to, we've run into some obstacles with that and had to learn how to make things better for her. And as she's aged, she's, you know, learned about her vision a little bit more <laughs> as, as it progressively gets worse she you know has to accommodate and we have to make accommodations for that as well so she's kind of a special case so then you know pulls on your heartstrings there too yeah so it's really hard yeah and marcy's just i mean she's great she's not a left aunt but she's <laughs> marcy's fine <laughs> we had so it's not like she was the first she's the only one we've actually kept the rest have moved on to other facilities to start breeding programs it's awesome poor marcy has young ki or youngest kid syndrome is that what that's called yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and um <laughs> they just go through an awkward phase when they're adolescents as you know most species do i suppose <laughs> um but she's coming around she's starting to mature i think that once she becomes a mom she'll She'll calm down a lot. When when they go through adolescence, they get a little bit more spunky. They're a little bit more flighty. Things startle them a lot more. Um, but she's she's finally kind of coming on the far side of that. And she's the only one that I've really worked with, worked through that with from, you know, being with her while she was born, going through that adolescent phase into their adult phase. <laughs> so who do we have coming over here right now? So Marcy's in the front and Shira, her mom, is behind her. Marcy, I hear you're spunky. She is spunky. She's a sweetheart. So pretty. I'm sorry, I don't have any more gloves, otherwise I'd scratch you. <laughs> um, Aaron <laughs> is um, asking, um, are bongos endangered? And I believe you said they're critically endangered, is that right? Correct, yeah, they're critically endangered, which the classification for that means 250 or less in the wild, and there's only about 100 of these guys in the wild. Yeah. So, They've been critically endangered for years. But they're so cute. <laughs> they are. All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and um, wrap up, Jake. Yeah. Um, let's get these guys, you know, one last look at our <laughs> adorable bongos. But be sure to tune in for us on Friday. Is that right, Jake? Friday at 1 p.m. We'll be back to celebrate and species day with another critically endangered species the cotton top tamarind oh uh, there's some sparring here <laughs> on facebook you can find us yep so we will see you guys on friday i'm super looking forward to this one i've been 
needing a cotton top tamarind fix for a, a while now. So, all right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you later.